well. The night beat starts right now. I love my little brother. And we're gonna miss him. Another victim of gun violence in San Antonio. Tonight, a vigil for the teen shot and killed, and the message one man is now hoping his community will take to heart. And tonight, we are live in the Rio Grande Valley as leaders prepare for a possible change in border policy. What's going to happen if Title 42 ends Monday? That's coming up. Plus, a vicious animal attack under investigation in San Antonio. One woman sharing the process she is now in the middle of. But first, they're preparing for change along the border as a COVID era policy that prevents migrants from entering the U.S. is set to end. Immigration officials along the U.S.-Mexico border are getting ready. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas in the Rio Grande Valley today to talk about what happens after Title 42 ends. Our Stefania Jimenez is along, uh, live along a U.S. port of entry with more. She's been there all day. Steph, a lot of moving parts and potentially people before next Monday. Yeah, you're right, Steve. You know, the Rio Grande Valley is really one of the busiest parts along the border as far as migrants crossing into the U.S. Specifically, that is why Secretary Mayorkas was here today. Now, the reason part of that is because this part, this area could get hit pretty hard if Title 42 were to end next week. And so that's why leaders, immigration officials, are preparing for a possible influx of migrants here to cross the border here. Now, the secretary is saying that he has a plan for this. It includes vaccinating migrants against COVID who are in Customs and Border Protection custody. The other plan is to add 600 Customs and Border Protection agents along the border. Now, that last part that I just told you, that is music to the ears of Customs agents who say that they need manpower if the border does get busier. Homeland Security says that with Title 42 in place since March of 2020, it has stopped hundreds of thousands of migrants from coming into the U.S. But Secretary Mallorca says that even if Title 42 does lapse next week, the borders will not automatically open for everyone. Listen. That does not mean that the border is open beginning on May 23rd. We continue to enforce the laws of this country. We continue to remove individuals who do not qualify for relief under the laws of this country. So the day that everyone is eyeing right now is Monday because that is the day that Title 42 is set to end. However, we wanna add a, really a, a caution to that because this, there's a lawsuit right now in federal court where we have a judge in Louisiana who's hearing a lawsuit brought on by 24 states, including Texas, who want to stop uh, Title 42 from ending on Monday. So whatever that judge decides really could determine what happens as far as the future of Title 42 is concerned. Now, it's important to note that even with Title 42 in place for the last 26 months, yes, some migrants have come into the U.S. We know that uh, they some have stayed with sponsors. Others have been allowed to stay at different uh, centers, attention centers, holding facilities along the border. That's where our Alicia Barrera met with a mother and daughter who want to come into the U.S. Watch. Jamie Solis and her three-year-old daughter, Darjeli Zamora, left their home country of Nicaragua with big dreams of a better life. Demasiado largo. Sí, ahí es terrible, ahí está bien reprimido. She described the two-week journey as too long, yet necessary, in order to flee from political repression and economic hardship. Yet under Title 42, Efren Olivares with the Southern Poverty Law Center says asylum seekers don't have a chance to present their case to a federal judge. That is all that we've been advocating for, right? Allow people to apply for asylum. It doesn't mean they get to stay. It just means give them a chance to apply and if they qualify, they get to stay. If they don't qualify, they may be deported. 
And Title 42 gets rid of all of that. U.S. authorities applied Title 42 in about four out of every 10 encounters. Jamie was one of the lucky ones. Her case will be heard by a judge, but she still fears being sent back to Nicaragua. Where she claims police wait to arrest those that have fled. Migrants who are processed and make it here to the respite center have a chance to get a change of clothes, get some food, and make that call back home. And as of now, operations remain as usual. Stefania? So Homeland Security is saying that a lot of migration patterns have actually changed in the last few years. It used to be that the majority of the time what they encountered were families trying to come into the U.S. But as of right now, they're saying the majority of people trying to come into the U.S. are single adults. Steve? And of course, we'll continue to follow what happens between now and Monday and far into the future from there. Stephanie Jimenez live from the border. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate it. And tomorrow night on the night beat, our border coverage continues with a story not about asylum seekers, but smugglers. This time we take a trip about an hour southwest of San Antonio. We're going to go to Dilly. The community there says they have seen a change as human smugglers move through the area. We take a look at the boost in resources they say is helping their community. It's tomorrow night on the night beat. The other big story tonight, in spite of a plea to turn up our thermostats a few days ago, the state's power grid managers say they are ready to keep power going in the hot summer months. The Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT, said there will be more reserve power available compared to last summer. They did not offer much of an update on last week's issues, though. They noted six plants went down on Friday. The Public Utility Commission says they were caught off guard, but explained they sent out an alert asking Texas to conserve as a precaution and certainly we've seen a heat wave. Let's bring in meteorologist Adam Kasky. Adam, this heat not going anywhere anytime soon. No, and we've had four days in a row now of a record high temperature in San Antonio. You look across the state a good portion of it triple digits. I mean, this is a late July, early August type of temperature map, but no, it's still mid May. Made it to 103 Pleasanton, 102 Hondo, 100 in San Antonio. That's a new record for the day by three degrees. The record last set back in 2003, but an end is in sight to this record breaking heat. Actually, a little cold front's on the way. We'll time that out for you, let you know when it hits and see if there's any rain chances coming up. See you in a few minutes. Thanks, Adam. Now to an issue San Antonio's police chief says is happening all too often. And it's hard to argue with him. 15 year old Ethan Soto shot and killed less than a block from where he lived, left to die in a street. Today, family and friends returned to the scene to honor his memory. People dressed in red carried candles and red balloons. Soto found dead on Alston Street. That's on the west side near Gilbert Garza Park off Callahan Road. Today's brother addressed gun violence in San Antonio and shared this message with the San Antonio community. Of course, put the guns down. Put the guns down. He was. He was a piece of my heart. But now that he's gone, more than a piece is gone. The police say there was some sort of argument before Soto was shot. Two teens were detained in yesterday's shooting, but still no word on any charges. One week ago today, San Antonio police had responded to 62 homicide cases. Soto would be the 63rd case so far this year. Compare that to the end of May last year when San Antonio police listed 61 homicide cases at that time. One nonprofit teaming up with local police officers in hopes of connecting with the kids who grow up where gun violence lives. As the night team's Patty Santos tells us, it's the first positive interaction some of these kids have ever had with police officers. The communities these children come from. <laughs> They've never had a positive encounter with the police when they, they see the red and flashing lights and somebody laying in the ground. But today could change things for some of these San Antonio kids and even adults. And that's what I've been doing, saying a personal thank you, because we will give them the head roll, but we will not say and acknowledge when someone's doing something positive. Diane Ross says this walk a mile in my shoes community event has softened her view on officers. And that's exactly what it's intended to do, says coordinator Troy Smith, a retired police officer. Both sides have gotten so much stress and been under so much pressure that it's just very hard for anybody to trust anybody. 
local community groups working with the police union invited 400 students for a match, hoping they can find common ground. By them working on the lanes with each other, they'll be able to die, have that dialogue with, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And Smith knows one game, one event isn't going to make a winning strike, but he knows it's a winning start. We know we need the citizens' trust, and this is one way of bringing that gap together. Between the playful jeers and cheers, connections were made. I do understand a little bit better of what it means to, to be a cop. And this is the first of many events Smith and the nonprofits are planning to put together this summer. He's actually asking the city of San Antonio to support a four-year pilot program that would bring more events like this to our community. Steve? Looks like it was fun along with everything else. Thank you, Patty. Still ahead on the night beat, one fan in the stand getting quite the surprise today how the San Antonio missions helped change the life of one military hero. We'll tell you how coming up. And a pet attacked by a pack of dogs. Now an investigation is underway. The process that one San Antonio woman is facing and what other pet owners should consider. It's coming up next on the night beat. Pet panic. Tonight, a woman wants answers after she says her chihuahua was brutally attacked by a pack of dogs. Animal Care Services spoke with the night team's Lee Waldman about what goes in to an investigation like this. This is the one that where they dug in. That was a real deep one. Little Fifi's wounds are still fresh and painful. For owner Sandra Lara, it's last Wednesday's attack that feels most raw. It's an eye waking experience. Laura says she was walking her two dogs around the corner of Seabreeze Drive in Diane Road when a pack of three dogs charged her, grabbing Fifi and shaking her. She called police and 311 to file a report, saying the dogs belonged to a woman who lived on the street. It's not the dog's fault because it really is the owners who should take care of the dog. Animal Care Services confirmed their dangerous dog investigators are looking into Fifi's alleged attack, which includes an affidavit filled out by Lara and the owner of the other dogs. So there's only two officers for the entire city. Uh, what we do is we investigate aggressive and dangerous dogs. The terms dangerous and aggressive aren't left up to opinions by Officer Shannon De La Cruz. They're legal terms set by the city of San Antonio and state of Texas. An aggressive animal is something that's either attacked, injured, or even killed another animal. Dangerous is going to be a dog on person. If a dog is deemed dangerous or aggressive by the city, then we can put the restrictions on those animals to prevent it from happening again. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Officer Dela Cruz says if you see a dog you believe may be aggressive in your neighborhood, you can report it just by calling 311. That's also the number you would call if your dog is attacked. Again, 311. In that case, officers will give you an aggressive animal affidavit to fill out. ACS also pointed out they don't help recoup money spent on vet bills after an animal attack. That would have to be done through a lawyer. The widow of a Bear County Sheriff's deputy fighting the county for her husband's death benefits. Bear County suing her. Deputy Timothy De La Fuente was the first deputy county de was the first Bear County deputy to die of complications from COVID-19. His widow, Pauline Pesina De La Fuente, has been getting her husband's weekly death benefits and reimbursement for his cremation costs. An administrative judge sided with her twice last year, but the county appealed both rulings and has since filed a lawsuit in state district court. My husband gave almost 28 years to the citizens of Bear County. He worked there more than half his life. His loyalty and dedication was unwavering. Sheriff Javier Salazar says De La Fuente was assigned to a COVID hotspot at the county jail at the time. But court filings show county officials say there's no evidence that he contracted the virus while working for the county. The county released a statement today offering the deputy's family its condolences and said in part, quote, we are working to ensure that Bear County funded benefits are paid out appropriately and in accordance with relevant law, end quote. They even want paid back for the deputy's cremation. You can read the entire Defender's full story right now on KSAT.com. The Spurs will be playing home games on the road next season. A few of them. Bear County commissioners approved the Spurs request today to play four home games away from the AT&T Center. 
The vote gives final approval to a plan initially approved earlier this month. Those games will be played in Austin, Mexico City, and at the Spurs' previous home court, the Alamo Dome. Well, new tonight, a special moment at the San Antonio Missions baseball game. U.S. veteran Army Specialist Craig Andrade honored and presented with that, a brand new modified truck. He lost both of his legs in an explosion while fighting in Iraq. The new modifications on this particular truck will still allow him to drive. The Disabled Veterans National Foundation worked to make it all happen, connecting Cavender GMC and the San Antonio Missions baseball team. And they made it happen and surprised him at the game today. What a surprise. By the way, you're in the market for a new truck. Uh, oh, the GMC almost. looked nice. All right, <laughs> it's, it's 81 degrees out there right now. And uh, yeah, we're in the middle of a heat wave. There's no doubt about it, a May heat wave. At least the AC works properly in my old truck. That's, that's true. Nice thing. That's true. It's a bonus. Is, are you Appreciate telling me that's that. the one thing that works properly in your old truck? I put some elbow grease into it, and there's other aspects that work pretty well, All right. especially the cassette player. I love the <laughs> tape deck. All right, let's take a look at the uh, temperature trend the rest of this week. Another record-breaking day likely tomorrow. Still well into the 90s, but just shy of records Thursday through Saturday. And then here we go. Boom, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, our high temperatures are back down in the mid 80s, which is right near average for this time of year. Temperatures right now, Del Rio hanging on to 96. A few light showers were trying to make their way across the Rio Grande and just over the past couple of hours, not with very little success. Otherwise, we've just got partly cloudy conditions and temperatures mostly in the 80s and some 70s closer to the coast. Kennedy, Victoria, 78. Gonzalez right now at 79. Hello to 82 degrees. Hondo 84. Uvalde up to 87 still in Bernie 79. By tomorrow morning, most of us right near 70 degrees. More of the same high humidity, sticky right near 70. Some low clouds around sunrise and then sunny and right near the century mark again tomorrow afternoon. By about 4 or 5 p.m. we should hit 99 we think officially in town, but a good chunk of Bear County and San Antonio, especially along and south of Highway 90, likely to be at 100 degrees. Even Nixon, 102. Floresville as well, Divine Hondo, 102. And dew points luckily will drop off during the hottest part of the day. That's been the trend for several days. It's common this time of year, and it's going to happen again tomorrow. So despite the heat, we're not going to have the high humidity to go with it during the hottest part of the day. There are some of those showers that were on parts of Texas in the higher elevations, or parts of Mexico in the higher elevations, but they had a hard time making it to Valverde County. Upper level high still in control for the most part. This little disturbance, a little dip in the upper level flow near Las Vegas, that's going to head our way along with a cold front. That's going to give us our next chance of a few storms, which is Friday. Right now, we only give it a 20% chance late Friday into Friday night. There is the possibility we could be increasing that. Stay tuned. We'll keep you updated. Otherwise, daily storm chances could pop up Saturday all the way into early next week, but it's still only at 20% at this time. Really quickly, Saharan dust is making its way into the Atlantic and likely to work into the Gulf of Mexico by Friday and could actually be here in our neck of the woods by Sunday. So the end of the weekend, we could actually have some of that Saharan dust. 71 in the morning, 99 by the afternoon. At least we'll have a breeze out of the south southeast at 10 to 20, gusting to 25 at times. The lowest point temperature wise Sunday morning near 60. That'll feel nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Adam. All right. Well, there were hopes that maybe the Spurs would get lucky. Maybe they would come out. Number one didn't happen. But odds are that's exactly where they were supposed to wind up was the pick they got tonight. When we come back, they had David Robinson up there representing the Spurs. And the big question was, could he improve from number nine on up? Well, for luck of the draft pick, the former number one from 1987. See how that worked out. And who did go number one? Coming up. The first pick in the 2022 NBA Draft goes to the Orlando Magic. That's who won the number one overall pick in the NBA Draft tonight. The only question is, who will they select with the top choice in big board sports? But first.
The Admiral David Robinson was sent to Chicago tonight to be the in-person representative for the Silver and Black in hopes that the former number one draft pick in 1987 could change the Spurs' lottery luck. With a 4.5% chance to land the number one choice and an over 20% chance to be in the top four, the Spurs wound up with the number nine overall pick right where forecasters had them finishing tonight. That number nine lottery pick will be teamed with number 20 from Toronto, number 25 from Boston in the first round. So what did the Admiral think of being the Spurs rep? It is a little bit funny in there. You know, it's a, everyone's uh, kind of being nice to you but rooting against you. And, <laughs> and so it's a, it's a little bit of an interesting atmosphere and um, great to see all these guys that I used to play against. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of drama. You know, they do a good job of kind of, you know, making it exciting. And for a minute there, you think you're going to get that number one pick. But, uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty happy for us to have a top 10 pick. That's amazing. That's awesome. The Orlando Magic won the NBA draft lottery for the first time since 2004 when they selected Dwight Howard. It was a four-time overall Orlando had lottery magic, including back-to-back -back years in 92 and 93, where they took Shaquille O'Neal and then traded the rights to Chris Webber for Penny Hardaway. So here's a look at the top 10 in the draft lottery. It will start with Orlando, followed by Oklahoma City, Houston, Sacramento, and Detroit. The second half of the top 10 will begin with the Indiana Pacers, followed by Portland, New Orleans, San Antonio, and Washington. Game one of the Eastern Conference Finals tonight in Miami and the Boston Celtics were dealt a major setback hours before tip-off. They were down two starters. Al Horford is out due to safety protocols, health and safety protocols, and Marcus Smart, spring foot. Former spur Derek White with the assist of Robert Williams for the third for the bucket and a nine-point lead. Miami ties the game at 21 on this Tyler Hero floater in the lane. Jason Tatum with 21 first-half points. This three helps Boston to an eight-point lead at halftime, but the Heat outscored the Celtics 22-2 to start the third quarter. They take game one right now that has just gone final. 118 to 107. Showdown between the Smithson Valley Rangers and the Reagan Rattlers in the high school baseball playoffs next. The third round of the high school baseball playoffs starting Thursday night will feature the Smithson Valley Rangers against the Reagan Rattlers. The scheduled three game series will be played at the Northeast School District Sports Park. That's after they were able to eliminate Westlake in a hard fought three game series by taking game three last Saturday, five to four. And that's after going 14 and one in district, 28 and five overall. Now they're going up against the Rattlers. A lot of teams have, have sought revenge on us this year because of what we did last year. And then, you know, we can just add them to the list of teams seeking revenge. And I mean, every time we play them, it's like we want revenge on them as well. It's just, it's just how it is. We get to play against some guys that I've known for a long time, some guys that I've been playing on with a long time. So it's really exciting to be playing against these guys once again. Reagan Rattlers got to the third round of the Region 4 high school baseball playoffs by winning back-to-back -back games against Cedar Ridge, 19-3 and 4-3. That's after finishing 14-2 to take district and going 27-5-1. Now they face their town and country rivals, the Rangers. A little rivalry going. You know, we played them thir third round last year, and um, uh, I mean, it's, it's a big week. And we, we've got a lot of focus this week. We, we know what's on the line, and we know our season's at stake, and it's, uh, it's playoffs, so any, anything can happen. The best of three game series starts at 7.30. Now, big matchup at the Tap State Softball Semifinals at UT Arlington tomorrow. That's where the University of the Incarnate Word High School Shamrocks will face the Antonian Apaches. We'll begin with the Shamrocks, who started their season off by losing five in a row in tournament play, including 13 to nothing shutout by Antonian. But the Shamrocks rebounded nicely to beat the Apaches on April the 5th, 8 to 5, only to close out their regular season with a 3 to 1 loss, but still took district. This will be their fourth beating of the season with much higher stakes. We've been in the playoffs every year, but the outcome's not always the same, and this is the furthest we've made it in the past two years. My, the only other time we've been to the Final Four is my freshman year, so this is pretty special. It's honestly really awesome because it's just cool to make it to the playoffs. I mean, you can say you made it round one, and then you make it round two. Um, so, I mean, it's really cool to make it past round one and two and get to Final Four and things like that. And there's no question these two teams have a lot of history going into the final four of the high school softball playoffs in just this season alone. That left the Apaches finishing second district, the Shamrocks. But remember, for Antonian, they were at the state softball tournament last year. This is a very special season in particular because we have seven seniors this year. So seven girls I grew up with and, you know, we've looked forward to this moment. Um, year two going back to state. So I'm really excited to see how it goes. We've played them a couple times this year, obviously, in district. <laughs> It's always a good game. It's always fun. The parents get all into it. We get all out, and it's a lot of fun. All right, the fun begins tomorrow at 10 a.m. Good luck to everybody. A couple rivalry games there. Yeah, it was looking good. Yep. Yeah, thanks. We'll be right back.
That does it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. For all of us here at KSAT 12, have a great night. See you tomorrow.